Where want to join me? Pledge of the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. March 6, 2014 at 6 p.m. Members present, Daryl Baker, clerk, K.K. Matthews, president, Charles Vance, commissioner, Charles McCain, commissioner. Uh, the meeting's called to order. So, um, I need a motion to approve the minutes of the regular session of the Lincoln County Commission that was held on February 20, 2014 at 6 p.m. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Be that being unanimous, the ayes have it. Let's move to public comment. Um, first off, we have uh, West Virginia American Water. Oh, they're not here. Uh, let's cross that out. The next is C.D. Label. Yes, sir. About trash. Good evening. About a year ago, if you all remember, I came to tell you about the trash on Route 3 and 214. And a couple days after that, I seen the black truck go up and down the road. Never did see it picking up any trash. And I think KK may agree with me that Smirko Mountain looks like a, a trash truck is dumped on it. And I feel that as many people on probation, home confinement, that there's no reason for this county to look like it's looking. I mean, you can go from Woodville to Hamlin, Allen Creek to Hamlin, and I'm sure Gain River is probably about the same. I know we've had a hard winter, but I know we've had a lot of pretty days in the last year. So, you know, in the next six, seven weeks, we're going to have weeds up. Yeah, you're not going to see the trash until the state comes by and mows it. Then we got us another mess. And I know, like, say, hey, they drove by, and that's all that happened. So, you know, I'd like for y'all to... Are you talking about they drove by to give the correction speak? I mean, yeah, you, to do you, told me, you told me a year ago when I talked to you, you told Murray or somebody to have them check on them. They did, they drove by. I seen them a couple days later drive up the road, down the road, and never did see them more. And the only place I seen them last year to work on Route 3 was around Sweetland. I do know they worked around that zone. But I think KK agrees, Smirko Mountain's a site. Yeah, I'm glad they got some recliner that was dropped. I'm glad they got that. It was always my thought, you know, that we tried to hit the main routes first. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I don't know either, but they have done a good job. I know this winter has been tough. But true, I mean, I agree with that. And I, I can tell you it's been about five, five and a half years ago since Route 3 has been cleaned with Woodville, the Hamlin, because that's when my wife was over it and they done it. And, and one other thing is uh, the lights out there on Quarter G for Jaeger Monument. I finally figured it out. We've been working on that. It's through AEP, but unless someone remembers there's no bill from AEP I called to just say that there's a street light out you know how you just report a street light out and I've given them you know tried to explain of course I'm not speaking to somebody right here so I'm trying to explain where it's at but I have no I, I, I don't I have no other way I don't know how to get it fixed to be honest well, unless we know somebody personal in, a, in an AEP area that we could talk to 
But I know they're like maybe a couple, three, you know, the spotlight. Right. Yeah. The lady told me on the phone that there had to be a bill. I said, then we don't pay that. So I don't know who's paying the bill. I said, you can't. So I said, maybe because we're a courthouse and it's a monument, maybe it's, they donate it. She said, no, we don't donate. Well, okay. I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what you else. You know, you might be able to talk with that guy. That that guy is is okay, maybe. Contact I do. I think I did. Really his car. Stuff, so I, I, okay. I, I meant to, I just found this out, but I meant to ask if anyone knew, because I see the bills. I knew there wasn't a bill, and I had no way to tell her where it's at. You know, I mean, I was explaining, but she said, there has to be a bill, and I need the account number and all this information to fix it. I said, you can't just pretend it's a street light? And she's like, no. You know, so I, I did try, but well, I'll I, call that. It's uh, been out for a year. I sent, uh, well, it's been out for a while. <laughs> I, I sent a, uh, I've been sending emails to Mary about it. I pass it every day. I, well, I, I mean, been, it's every, been every morning, it. and it's, it's gone. There's, uh, there hasn't been anything done on it yet. And but Louis Louis Runyon has also called me several times about it. But it's trying to get you know. I know they was, was the you know that, my big thing was what you know was the bulb was you know was there something wrong with the with the light? Oh, and right. I thought it was like like we had put the commission had put up or something to spotlight the the monument, but it's not. It's through AUP. So I'll call that guy that got Basin talked about, and maybe he can help me. Figure out. I mean, if we have to drive out and point and say, "Look that light right yeah, there," right. I will. But I don't know. Just have to go out early enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to. And, and one other thing, I wish I didn't put it on there, and then I get off. I went to the water board meeting last week, and uh, they had on the agenda for uh, a self-help project, and the self-help project was for Dr. Lauren Smith and his son and. Uh, Another gentleman, and uh, with Mr. Gregory, he agreed that the county could spend or could spend one hundred thirty thousand dollars for three houses and all of it on private property. So he told uh, Doc Smith to come to you all about donating fifty thousand dollars. To reimburse him if he put the line in. Well, I'm, what I'd like to say, you know, people on Heritage Road, or to the mountain, they have uh, signed petition. I think Mr. McCann might be able to agree with that. But you know, if there's going to be a self-help project, then people have waited up there for years. And to me, if we can put 15 houses on the line versus three houses that are, are is totally on private property. Somebody told me from where the water line is to Dr. Smith's house is a mile. I don't know. But you know, they got the engineer and everything else and I just hope that if it comes before y'all, y'all will consider taking that money and, and helping people on how to get ready. Yeah, I can give you some background on that. Okay. I was there whenever Dr. Smith came um, to the meeting. And um, he was very his, what he was talking about was he had paid a tax fee. <coughs> they had paid tax fees like 10 years prior and they were expecting water and they never received water. And um, the amount of money that was um, given were actually appropriated um, to, the, to that particular project. Um, it was not actually requested by the Lincoln PSD. I mean, the PSD will request money if you know for any, right. any particular project like that but it wasn't necessarily requested um, and there hasn't been any money that was actually distributed huh? to the like, right. um, but um, I think as far as the rules are concerned with water uh, there has to be a certain amount of people and you know there has to be it has to be under a certain cost so regardless of whether you do a self-help project or or whatever it is it has to be feasible, and it has to be by the standards of the I mean, of the Public Service Commission. And I think that that's that's kind of where it was, um, because what they wanted to do, and I think they uh, sent that to an engineer, um, to an engineering firm, to see how much it was going to cost, because they really didn't know how much it would cost to run that line. 
And, and it, you know, the question was, you know, can we do this legally? Do this, and uh, and I think that's why it hasn't been done. Well, it's because that last Thursday, look out for your John can enlighten you on it. But the way that Mr. Gregory talks says we can't put our money in it, but if you'll buy the material and stuff, maybe you get the county commission to reimburse you fifty thousand dollars. No, Am I right, John? Is that about what it was saying? Well, he told, he said that, that, you know, for him to come and talk to, to you guys about that and see what they could do or what you could do for them on the self-help problem. But I think from, it was my take whenever I was there, because I wasn't there at the last one because of, I had surgery. But um, it was my understanding from that meeting is that there have you know there's certain there's specifications right. that you have to abide by, and that's where I left it right. at, at that because it has to you know it has to go before many you know a lot of different people before it, it's even approved right. for anything of that nature. Was that young guy engineer that sat over against the wall? <laughs> yeah. Okay, he was the one that. Uh, Ron talked to, and he was the one to come up with what, 130,000? No, it wasn't him. That was a different engineer that we hired. They wasn't present there at that meeting. That was our engineer. Okay. But they hired another one to do that, but he wasn't there. But anyway, I hope y'all consider the people on hired to drug. All right. All right. All right. Thank y'all. All right. I think uh, American. West Virginia American Water is here, am I correct? Um, would you like? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I'm trying to get out and talk to different uh, stakeholder groups and answer any questions, but I can start with a couple of questions that are most asked regarding the Elk River spill that we've all been addressing as a community for two months. First question that people ask is why didn't we simply shut down the intake? Well, there's there's a lot of things to consider around providing water. The first of which is the conditions that we had at the facility following the polar vortex freeze, which everyone has probably heard that term. We had deep cold that we have not had in several years. And the combined effect of that is that a number of pipes were broken in the system. I think you'll find all over North America this year people have had extreme amount of pipe breakage in their water systems. Ashland, Kentucky's had a major problem, and I know a lot of the, the local service providers have had you know, issues with water breaks and keeping water in the pipes. But not only that, customers turn on their taps to let water run so their services don't freeze, and we actually encourage that. Water is only about a penny a gallon, but when you look at the cost of replacing a service, it's much, much more effective just to let a little water run when it gets really cold. But when you look at what that meant for us on January 9th is that our system was very low of water and that we were running almost max rate capacity, much higher than what we normally run, and we weren't, we weren't making any headway. So our analysis at the time, if we'd shut off the water, we'd had people out in the downtown core within 15 minutes to two hours, and in retrospect, on engineering analysis, the whole system would have been empty in 10 hours. And you have to envision what that would have left the community of 300,000 people to deal with. One, they'd have no fire protection whatsoever. There'd be no water in the pipes anywhere. And two, there'd be no basic sanitation. A third consideration is that we had no idea how long the plume would take to go by the treatment plant. We, we know that it took at least three days for the water in the river to clear of this product sufficiently. And the fourth element is that how long would it have taken us to get the supply back? Across 3,000 square miles, 1,900 miles of pipeline, we estimate conservatively, through engineering analysis, that it would have taken us 30 days to restore water to all parts of the system. So yes, we decided not to shut it off, and we made, we made that decision cognitively. It was a thoughtful decision to protect the community. American Water Works Association would suggest that people drink less than 1% of the water that's produced by most systems. It's used for many other purposes, but very limited uses for human consumption. But we recognize the effect that this product, this, this material that was spilled 
by Freedom Industries has a very strong licorice or black anisette odor that when people smell it in their water, they're concerned. And we share, we share their frustration, and at times I get angry about this whole event. This secondary <coughs> containment would have prevented this from occurring. And secondary containment to a chemical or a tank, you know, someone who has care and custody of these products should be an absolute thing to have in place. It would have prevented this event. If we knew today what we knew then, or sorry, the other way around, if we knew then what we know today, we would have made the same decision because we weren't faced with good decisions that day. We were faced with the hard decisions because someone's actions forced us into that place. We have worked tirelessly with our team and the National Guard. The National Guard has been a force multiplier for us. They've been fantastic mm -hmm. to work with. I owe them all of the respect that I have. They brought people in that were knowledgeable, were able to assist in a real and meaningful manner. And we worked through the system very quickly to be able to get to where we were below the CDC guidance of one PPM, the protective health limit. So that was cleared. The entire system was cleared below that limit by 18th of January. Now that seems like a long time, but when you, you put that against the other options of people having to drive to go to the bathroom at a mall where a porta potty may be placed, and I don't know where you'd get enough of them, or someone starting a fire or having a fire in a downtown area and losing all those, those facilities, or people leaving their homes empty and having break-ins because there's just too much for the, you know, the police to protect. I, I think it was a good outcome. Now, the customers continue to be worried about water because that smell threshold, even though the water is appropriate for use and it's usable by everyone at one part per million, that odor threshold is down below detection limits by machines. So our lowest detection limit is two parts per billion. That's 500 times less than the protective health limit. But people can still smell it below that level. So we didn't stop at the one part per million. We went through the entire system and checked it to, at that time, the best an analytical method we had was 10 parts per billion. We cleared every part of the system at that point, and then we went further to go down and do it again below two parts per billion, testing and flushing as we went. And on top of that, we went to all the small dead end mains, inch and a half and two inch mains, and flushed them. There were several thousand of those, and there was no lab that could provide the tests. So we did that by odor, which is the best indication of whether this product is in the water or not, because you can smell it at low, <coughs> such low thresholds. We had close to 40 people from out of state come and spend 10 days with us. And in nine days, they were able to flush the far ends of the system, all the dead ends, to get down. And that's when we put out the recent press release that we felt the system you know, was proved out below two parts per billion and that we had flushed everything. So really now what we're into is a rebuilding of the confidence of our customers. We still respond to customer complaints of individual customers call. We're getting less than a handful a day of people that are, are calling regarding you know, that specific odor in the system. We have actually more people calling because of you know, dirty water, if you will, stained water in their plumbing because of all the flushing we've done is disturbed materials in the pipe, and that's typical after flushing. It doesn't mean the water's harmful, it's just you got to run it through until it clears up. So that's where we've been, you know, and it's been, a, it's been a challenging event, one that we know the legislature is trying to prevent through its tank farm or tank protection bill. Uh, we, we support that activity. We support a number of the activities coming out of the legislature. We just want to make sure what's done is appropriate for water customers around the state. Um, and that it's meaningful to prevent something like this from happening again. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions you may have of me. I do have a, uh, a briefing notes that I can leave behind if you'd like several copies. Let me, uh, let me ask you, on, on your surveillance of your in, intake up there at your, your uh, pro, the process, where you actually process the water, Bef are you doing anything different now as far as monitoring that versus what you were before the spill? I mean, or basically my question was, what was, what was your, how did you monitor the intake on that prior to this happening? I mean, you know, I, and, and the question being, I don't know how long, you know, I, I think a lot of people are concerned about how long that thing might have been leaking and, you know, and whether you caught it the day it started leaking a lot versus, I mean, it, what are the procedures that you have instituted <coughs> since then that would allow you to catch that sooner if it happened again? 
Well, let me tell you what's there at the facility that has been there and is, and is still there today. Our operators have the ability to go out and do analytical methods. There are a lot of methods that are done continuously on the water. We do pH, temperature, um, but we also do regular analytical methods on the water and our processes are monitored continuously, which can show changes. If something comes down the river, there will be changes. This, this is a very stable water source. We have been providing water off that river since early 19, early 1900. But our operators know that the material is not coming into the treatment plant. We have all of the, the systems that we detect water at or we can sample water at come into the lab. So they're all plumbed into the lab. And this had such a low odor threshold that we could smell it as soon as it showed up at the treatment plant. And it was not there present before this event. So that's, that's how we know that it occurred on the 9th and that we started to see it coming into the raw water in the afternoon hours on the 9th. But we continue to do our, our normal method of detection. The biggest thing is you have to rely on industries to pre prevent materials from getting to the waters. And then when they do get to the waters, they have to notify you. But I'll tell you that we had all the notice that we needed. We've got enough notice to put our emergency plan and our vulnerability plans into effect. We're a water company. We remove contaminants from water all the time. It's river water. You can't drink it. That's what we do. So we put into place our plans. We augmented the treatment process. We went to find out about the material up at Freedom Industries. We reacted. We consulted with the Bureau of Public Health. And we put all that in place very quickly. And it was only when the amount of this product overwhelmed our treatment plant and got into the finished water that we then had to issue the do not use because there was no way at that day to quantify this. We knew we could see it in the river because we have analytical methods like gas chromatograph mass spec that would show us the, the, the spike of the material, but it wouldn't give you the quantification of how much was there. And we didn't know what an appropriate limit was, so in an abundance of caution to protect the customers, and as per the Bureau of Public Health regulations, you issue a do not use in those circumstances, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, I don't know what this particular piece of legislation that they're putting through as far as uh, making the water safer and things, but uh, I was just wondering if you felt that the new legislation would help you, because I, you evidently, you all didn't know what was above you. If you know what I'm saying, I mean, unless you did, I mean, uh, but the chemicals, I think, you know, it looks to me like any, any of these plants and things like that ought to at least know what's going to be, might be introduced if something would happen above them. I think and, a big difference, if I can, is that before this event, there was no obligation of any industry or anybody to tell us what was in their tanks or at their sites. With the legislation, there will be. And that information will be helpful to know the impact. We knew that Freedom Industries was there. It had always been a, you know, a place that was storing diesel fuel and gasoline and the like, but we did not know it was MCHM. And even that product itself is not on the list of toxic substances by the EPA. You know, they have close to 85,000 substances on that list. This is not one of them. It's well, not one of the regulated substances that you monitor for in drinking water. Well, and, and I understand that. But I, you know, and I, I guess you've answered my question because I'm, I'm a practicing physician. I see some of these people that get sick. Yes, sir. And, you know, it's a situation where, uh, I, and I'm glad they're addressing this as far as you knowing what's above you because, well, you know, whether you can check for it or not or whether you know whether it's lethal or not, you, you don't know. And so to me, the way to handle that might be to find out what's above you. And if it's something that's going to kill 100,000 people that enters the water supply, we might not want that above you. And, and it might have to be addressed that way. And, and, and as far as your comments, as far as the MCHM or whatever it was called, uh, you, know, it, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't toxic at certain levels that become toxic once they get in situations. Because, you know, in the ones that we know what we're you know, if we, if we take something in and we know that we're, you know, drinking too much alcohol and things like that, that's up to us. But, you know, I think it, it, it and I think you've addressed a lot of this, but I think it's up to the legislators and to the water company to make sure it's safe whether you know something's toxic or not. If you know it's up there and you start, you know, if you knew the MCHM was up there and you start smelling lake brush down here, you can do it exactly, you can make the connection right then. You know what I'm saying? Basically, because it's my understanding so a bunch of this stuff kept pouring into the water system up there. And was it stopped when it was originally found? 
And my concern is to be proactive about it, you should know what's above your water supply, and I think maybe the laws will allow you to do that. Because, I, you know, to me, it comes down to the fact that, and I've kind of watched the legislative process with these laws, and, uh, you know, everybody's got the reason not to have things done or not to have this done or whatever, but I think we all got to look at it from the aspect of, you know, do we want our kids and grandkids drinking this? And, and I think it, it may be okay now, but, you know, what happens if uh, you get something that's much more toxic into your water and you, you handle it the exact same way, you know, you may have a totally different result than what you had with this particular thing. Because I think a lot of it was based upon the, the exact amount it went into the water and how, how basically, but you just think of what, what went into the water, and I don't know the exact amount that it was, but it affected this whole system. I mean, people down here could smell it. You know, and and and, and I think they, you know, when I go back to the, I think they, it's a lot of the gas uh, work that we do when we drill for gas and stuff, and, and, and we put a smell in that gas so we can, if it gets into our homes, we know it's wrong. You know, that we can smell this stuff. And somewhere along the line, I think it takes some guts on the part of the legislators, and, uh, you know, like I say, I'd rather be proactive and we stop it before it happened. I'm sure you would too. I mean, it's a lot less costly to you to do that. But, you know, my concerns have always been monitoring the intake. You know, you, you know, if it takes a, somebody standing there smelling or, or, or running the tests or whatever, because if you only run a set of tests every third day, or I don't, and I don't know how you do it, but to me, you, you have to be more wary of these type things, especially when you're in an area where you know there's going to be contaminants above you. And in that area, there is. I mean, you know, there's, there's quite a few. And, and we see it in all of our streams. But, I mean, this is something that you don't, all of our streams don't affect this many people when it gets in the water supply. And your guys' water supply does supply these people. So I guess it's basically, you know, there's a lot of frustration among people that they didn't know when to drink, whether it's safe for their kids to drink. And they came out with, you know, and, and I know a lot of that you couldn't handle because, I mean, I, or you, it wasn't addressed to you because it was other people saying things. But there was such a mixed message coming out. It's okay for an adult to drink it, but we don't want a pregnant woman drinking it. You know, and things of that nature. And, and, and you're always going to have disagreement among the doctors involved with those. Some are going to say this is safe and that's safe. But I think you really got to look at it from the point that if there's anything else that you guys could do to stop it, I'm sure you would, and that's what we would hope you would do. And, and, but, and I think the legislators also, when they go back enact these laws, they look at what's best for the general population, not what's best for this particular industry or this particular companies or whatever. Because a lot of times when we get legislation going through our legislature, it winds up getting those things added that, that may even make it more difficult for you to do your job. And I think what we need from them and from everybody involved is to make sure that our number one priority is safe drinking water for all these people that can't control it. Uh, and, and I guess and that's why I ran about it a little bit, but, but I mean, I, I, you know, the, the effects that, that you can see as a physician uh, are, I think, you know, we don't know what's going to happen five years from now, ten years from now. You know, we're just, we're looking at what goes on at DuPont and things of that nature with what, the, the byproducts of what goes on over there. And we don't know exactly how this is going to affect our, our patients and our kids and things like that. So it's really hard for me to, to listen to someone say, well, this wasn't listed as a toxin. And, you know, I, I know that if you can eat honey sometimes and you get sick from it. And because there's toxins that can be in it. But that's why we don't give it to babies. And, and I think that's the lesson we all need to learn is when we have something that goes wrong like this, we do everything we can to make sure it doesn't happen again. Not particularly how we address it after it happens, but to make sure that if we can, we can prevent that from happening. And I'm sure you, I'm sure your company would rather deal with it that way than the other way that costs you a lot more money. But I do think that, you know, I, I just don't like people patting themselves on the back saying this was a really good job. I mean, I, I know you can, only can do what you can do. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've had physicians that went through surgery with people before on my patients, and they did a really good surgery, and the patient wound up dying anyway. And that happens. But, I mean... When we're looking at a situation, that patient decided he had, he had to have surgery and he went under that surgery. We're talking about people here that don't have any decision to make other than whether they drink the water or not. So I think it behooves all of us to <coughs> have any input into that to make sure that we say what we feel needs to be said about that. But uh, I, I, I do think one of the problems that I saw when I was watching things the way it unveiled was the fact that 
we had multiple stories coming from multiple people, and, and I think that aggravates people when they see that. And I know you can't do anything about that, and neither the, can the, the individuals that talk. But, you know, I, I, as I said, I, I really think looking at it from the end point that let's, let's make the, the, the water as safe as we can coming into, into your input, into your uh, thing. And whatever we can do, we want to do that because that helps you do your job. And, it, and it's a tough job. And it's only going to get worse as the water supply is, is not as available as, as it has been before. So, but anyway, that's all I have. I'm not sure if I could just respond in a couple points there. I would agree absolutely that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that, you know, if they had secondary containment, this would not have occurred. And I think that's where a lot of the legislation is going. The view on the early detection systems are difficult. It's not that we're opposed to them. Nothing could be further from the truth. But they don't exist. And that's well, the problem. Well, it's real hard to have an early detection if you don't know what chemicals are above you. That's what I'm saying. You but know, even if you, if you do, sir. There's a toxin up there, then you know what to monitor for, too. But even if you do, you don't, because there's rail, there's road, there's barge traffic that all presents. We're a water company that looks at vulnerability assessments and risk assessments on a daily basis. There's also intentional harm that can occur either in the raw supply or the finished water. We, we put in the best mechanisms that are available to deal with these things. We have an award-winning treatment plant. We've been here for 130 years. You know, our, our number one priority is our customers and the protection of those customers. And we have very robust systems. We have an award-winning treatment plan. But even, even if you know everything that's up there, that doesn't mean that there won't be something else in a mobile transport that could cause a problem. But we're not against. But there is no CSI device or no, you know, Captain Kirk, you know, device that will, you can plug in and put in the river and it will tell you everything that's in that water. We have methods that detect volatile organics can be smelled as well as analyzed by machines. So we're not against it. We're working with the legislature and everyone else and we'll evaluate as we go forward. But on January 9th, we knew enough and we had enough time to respond in the most appropriate way for this community. Now, unfortunately, with the system, there is no ability to shut it off under the conditions that we were faced. And that was not available to us. Now, the CDC put out the 1 ppm as guidance for all users and all purposes, later said that pregnant women may want to consider it an advisory like they do for drinking and smoking, like you mentioned. But I'm just the facts-based organization. When, when someone that regulates us says, this is the limit, I have to meet that limit. And I have to make sure the water is compliant with that limit. And that was our job, and by the 18th, that's where we were. After that, we were dealing with an odor issue. And we smell things all the time that don't mean, doesn't mean that they're harmful to us. But I understand that perception and that concern. That's why we put all the efforts that we did into making sure it was eradicated from the system. But, you know, we're not at odds here. I understand what you're saying, and I understand the concerns of the community. And we've been here for a long time, and we're going to stay here and work with the community to rebuild the company. I appreciate that, you know, and I don't want to, you think I'm antagonistic more than I have to be. I don't, I don't. But, but you know, it, 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 it's, I, my main concern is, is, is that whether that input has any, is it any better than what it was when, the, when this happened? I mean, are you all doing anything that you would say would make it tougher for this chemical or any other chemical to get into that spot? And if you say no, then that's okay. But I mean, but it to me tells me that we didn't address the problem. We did, you know what I'm saying? We, did, we didn't address the problem. I say it, is, it has. To be honest, the legislation will because it focuses on where this event started. Well, and, with and, the and, people that have care and custody of these products to make sure not only do water purveyors know about it, but first to make sure that their, their, their systems are appropriate, that their equipment is maintained in an appropriate fashion so it prevents it. That's, that's the answer. Well, 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 and I agree it's the answer that the legislature should have taken, but what I'm questioning is really what West Virginia American Water's done. You know, I mean, is there is there anything that you all have changed that will make you be able to catch something quicker, or are you in the process of looking into things like that? I mean... I would say yes, because okay. people can okay. see that right now we're doing analysis on the raw water every two hours okay. through gas chromatograph, but we're looking at all options. Regardless of what the legislature is doing, 
we look at all vulnerabilities and assessments. We learn from every event that we get faced with around the country. And, and we'll look at this as a water purveyor and we'll look at what makes sense from an engineering perspective. Remembering that we always make decisions in, in the mind of the customers with the mindset that the customers are burdened by the cost of everything we do. So there's a balance between we want to make sure we engineer effective that are meaningful to the community in the future. There was a lot of other questions that got asked to us, why didn't we have a second intake? Well, the record is that we applied for a second intake when we went to build this facility and it was rejected. It wasn't allowed. Well, I kind of think that's where I'm getting to is that I don't rely so much on the legislatures as you guys. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what the legislation is going to come out. I don't know what they're going to require of these companies and things of that nature. But when it comes down to it, you guys are the ones that make the buck off the dollar. And, and that means to me that even if it takes a little bit of that buck to do better surveillance at the end, take, if it's possible, and I don't know, but if that could be done, then that could be, should be done. And no matter whether it costs a little bit of that buck or not, you know, we ought to, we ought to be able to say, you know, we're not going to send 700 or 900 people to a hospital like this. And, and uh, but that's, you know, it's just my thoughts. But, but I appreciate your comments. I really do. Thank you. Well, I'll go on the latter side. When did you start drinking water after January 8th? Well, I followed our protocols. So when we had to do not use, I did not use the water. I, I hate the smell of baby wipes, to be frank, right now. <laughs> that's how I was, you know, cleaning. Um, I was at work a lot. So when they lifted the area, and I'm not sure exactly what day they lifted the area. My wife flushed our house. You know, she, she took care of all the, you know, the protocol that we published. My wife did that, and I went home the next day, and I had a shower, and I started drinking the water. As soon as the water was available for use under the, the lifting of the bands, I was using the water. That's good. I'm still having trouble drinking that shower. <laughs> <laughs> Confidence. I'll get there, I'm sure. Just as yeah. a mom, as a mother. Yeah. <laughs> well, one, I think Doc hit it about it. You have no indication that something could occur if a child used this in five years, ten years. We have no... Now, when the CDC looked at the, the... One thing is to understand is you never take any of these products that are out there and test them on humans. So you're always going to take some kind of animal study. So the CDC used the information available and put what they call safety factors. One of those factors is converting the effect on animals to the effect on humans. They, they add a safety factor. They added another safety factor for short-term acute effect to long-term effect. Then they added a factor for pregnant women, immunocompromised, and youth. And that's how they came up with the one part per million. And they've not moved off that they believe that one part per million is an appropriate level for this product for all uses and all users. But after that, they put out an advisory for pregnant women so that women know to make a choice. And they've, they've told me directly it's really the same thing as that they do for alcohol, which people can consume legally, for smoking, that women who are pregnant should have more information so that they can make a choice. And, and that's really, I think, confused the heck out of the community. One, with the timing that they did it, and I appreciate the CDC that on that next day, they gave us a target of what was safe in the water. If we didn't have that, it would be very hard to work to restore the water system. But coming out a few days later with the advisory, you know, caused, when, when a community is concerned, just caused confusion and concern about what was the safe level. Because well, the, I think there's a, there was a lot of concern. I mean, there was a, there's not a lot of data on that. that that particular toxin. I mean, even the CDC didn't have a lot to look at, I don't think. You know, so basically I think they were going with a, I'm not going to say a generic one per million part or things like that, but, you know, uh, if you don't have a lot of data to you have that data, you can't make an accurate estimation of how, what kind of uh, impact it's going to have on the population. And I think they did the best they did, but I think one of the reasons they came out with a warning afterwards was the fact that they didn't have a lot of data to go on, and it's always better to err in safety's sake. And I think that's the situation that exists in that particular realm, because having monitored that when it went through, you know, I think that's what they came up with. And, you know, they, 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 it's good to have a number to say it's safe under that number, unless that number's not the right number. And, 
you know, and I think in this case, uh, there's not a lot of data that tells us that. So, but uh, you, I, and I agree with you. You did exactly what you know you should have done when the CDC come out with it. But I think when you look at what they were dealing with at the CDC and some of their people was there wasn't a lot of information to look at as far as this this particular toxin. And, and you know, somewhere that needs to be addressed as far as what may or may not get in the water too. I, I do have one more. You said that you got several calls on like uh, dirty water and that. Has one of the calls not been, if you haven't used the water the whole time and some people didn't even flush as they were directed, how come their water bill was doubled or tripled? Uh, a lot of people had either estimated bills in January or the period before in December mm -hmm. that elevated their bills, but we work off, you know, if your bill was estimated, it's always corrected with actual reads at some point. We had some of that that mm -hmm. we know of. We also had people that were letting their water run. When you let your water run, you do use quite sure. a bit of water. Sure. Again, it is cheaper than fixing your service. But remember the kind of cold that we were facing. Our, our production levels before the night, we normally, last year in October, November, we were pumping about 27 million gallons. On the ninth, we were pumping 43 million gallons before this event. So there was a lot of usage occurring that predates any of the, the flushing protocol. Okay. All right. Gentlemen, I'll uh, pass this up to Zoe. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for coming, Mr. McIntyre. Am I correct? Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a good one. All right.